Um, so that, what was the part? That was, were we asking something else then? Um, I, well, digress, so, I digress so much. That's, I, the, that's your next book has got to be called I Digress. I Digress, yeah. exactly. Um, so, oh, children's theatre. Oh, yes. No, it, uh, Old the safari. children's television. Old so safari. then I was asked, during that period after that, I was asked to do Old Safari, which was a children's television programme. Uh, I, I think I'd already done Rent-A-Ghost, which was fantastic. Oh, that was good. That was Linda, La Linda LaPlante was in that. Yes, she? but do you know, what? Do you, do you know uh, all of you know, I'm sure, that Sue Nichols played Miss Popoff, if you remember the series. But in fact, the original Miss Popoff was Linda, Linda Marshall, Marshall, who became Linda LaPlante, the crime writer. And she tells wonderful stories. She goes to things like this and talks about her crime novels, and, the, and then she takes questions, and the first question they ask her is, what was it like doing Rent-A-Ghost? And she's <laughs> furious. She gets very angry. But anyway, so um, we... Um, uh, I've digressed again. Yeah, so getting into children... So you oh, yeah, did so, yes, Safari. Right. So, and then I did a show called On Safari, which, again, I kept turning down because I thought, I don't want to become a personality. How silly I was. And they kept putting the money up for that, and eventually I did that. Don't get me wrong, I don't do things just for money. I'm here tonight, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, no, it is... And I suppose, as you pointed out yesterday, you know, we have to earn a living. Well, it's, in America, if you do all of these things, they say you're very multi-talented. Yeah. But in, in this country, I mean, it's all been legitimised now for people like you who are proper actors doing panto, and Ian McKellen doing pantomime. Yes that we have to turn a trick. It's what we do. We, and... we, we do. I mean, it, 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 you know, we all have to pay mortgages and things. Mm -hmm. I don't pay any mortgage. I've got rid of mine. Oh, isn't it a wonderful... <laughs> have you done that? Have you still got yours? Oh, dear, you've got... Oh, what a shame. That's why you're so sad. <laughs> no, it, it, you're, you're not. You're lovely. But, I mean, the thing is, it is it, you know, it is when you... Uh, Margaret Thatcher told me to go out. Not me personally, but she told us all, my generation, to go out and buy a house. But the, the, the years, 25 years oh. of paying a mortgage. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. And the relief when you don't have to pay it is just wonderful. So when somebody offers you a highly paid job, which is an art form, pantomime, is after all based on Commedia dell'arte and it is an art form if done properly not by some soap star who's never done anything doesn't understand it um, but when done properly it is an art form and it is hard work it and, is. and it's children's first experience of the theatre if you can grab them then and it's live and it's working with an audience it is wonderful and of course you know there are a lot of people who do pantomime I get very 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 well paid I'm not going to tell you but I do get very well paid however there are some people who do five weeks at the London Palladium who get a quarter of a million pounds for that season yeah I'm not mentioning any names. No. But, <laughs> but it is interesting. There's a lot of money to be made in pantomime. Um, I, uh, I just love it. And the thing I love best about pantomime is the song sheet at the end with the children. That is my favourite. And I've had some wonderful experiences. When I was in Darlington, my very first pantomime, um, at the Civic Theatre playing Mother Goose, which I always call the Hamlet of the... Mm. Uh, of the Panto dame world because it's she's never off it's all about her and I remember I was doing the pantomime there was a little boy I can see him now sitting where you are madam and he had a little blue sweater on and a, blue, and a white shirt and a blue bow tie and his eyes were wide open and he was absolutely with every line that you said and, and his mother kept whispering to him and I thought oh this was he was just adorable so when I asked for children to come up he was the first up and his, the mother was trying to stop him but he was the first up and there he was and I left kept him to the end and I went through the other children and I got to him he was hysterical absolutely hysterical and uh, I kept him to the end and they got rid of the others and I gave him an extra present and all that off he went and I went to do my quick change uh, for the finale, and all the cast were in tears. And I, I couldn't think what was going on. I said, what's going on? What's the matter? They said, they couldn't, no one could tell me because I was doing a quick change. Anyway, came on, took curtain call, uh, thanked the audience for coming, curtain come down, and I, turned, I said, what's going on? They said, you don't know, but he was totally blind. And it was the most extraordinary moment, and the mother wrote me a letter, which I've still got, 42 years later, saying that she couldn't believe the reaction of this boy and that he was so involved and he so wanted to come up 
and that I change this little boy's life. And that mm. is what is marvellous. Yeah. By the same token, I was many, about 10 years later in Brighton doing pantomime, and Boxing Day, which is one of the worst performances you could possibly go to at a pantomime, because everybody's full of turkey. Everybody's sitting there going, all right, entertain us, go on, go on then, all right. And it's really tough. So anyway, we had the children up for the, the song sheet, and this is Boxing Day. So I said to this girl, she was about 13, I said, and what did Father Christmas bring you? And she went, nothing. And I went, you could feel the audience chill. I mean, it was awful. I said, no, no, you must have got something. And she went, no, nothing. And I went, nothing? And I went, why? She said, we're Jewish. <laughs> well, there was a huge laugh just like that. I mean, that, but you know, it's terrible. You get yourself into these situations. And then a few days later, uh, there was a, a little boy who was quite frail. So I said, well, I'll be with you in a second. I turned to the next child. As I turned, this boy went, <laughs> and I turned back and I said, don't worry. As I said, don't worry, we went, Bleh! so we were ankle deep in vomit. <laughs> I had to get all the other children off, and then I had to get, uh, I had to get the comedy policeman to come on and clear it all up. <laughs> Terrible mess, but that's what's so wonderful. You don't know what's going to happen. I mean, that is the fantastic thing about pantomime, and I, and I love it. And I'm going to do it again for two more years. I'm going to do this year, I'm going to Richmond in Surrey, the gorgeous Theatre Royal, and then I'll do one more the following year because I'll be 70 that year. I know you can't believe it. No. <laughs> Impossible. I'll be 70, and I, I'll retire then from pantomime. Not other things, but from pantomime. Yeah. Um, and after you'd done the children's programs, um, you did, of course, that wonderful program that reunited you for the first time with the lady who was to become your great friend, uh, Cilla Brack. You did Surprise, Surprise, which was originally a vehicle for you as much as it was for her. It was. I mean, I co-starred with Cilla, and um, it was fantastic. Uh, I, was, uh, I couldn't believe it when... Um, the producer of the show, Alan Boyd, came to see me in pantomime in Newcastle and took me out for dinner and said, we want you to do this series uh, on Saturday night or Sunday night, whatever it's going to go out on, and it's a big variety show called Surprise, Surprise, and it's you and Cilla Black. And I was absolutely, I couldn't believe it, because Cilla Black, I was brought up with Cilla Black, you know. I didn't tell her that at the time, but um, <laughs> as a child, you know. I used to listen on my mother's knee or some other low joint, you know, it was... Um, anyway, but she was, it was fantastic. She, and she was great. We got on very, really, really well. And I went through all of her husband, you know, dying, and we helped her enormously. And right up to her death, we were still really close friends. And, and in fact, I, I often think to myself, oh, I must ring Scylla and tell her. And of course, she's not there. You know, you forget. But she was very important in my life. And um, I was saying only yesterday that I think it was the proper way, though, because to die like she did, which was, you know, she was having a, I think she was sunbathing on the balcony. She came in either to go for a wee-wee or to get a drink, and she fell and hit her head, and that's how she died. And she didn't die in pain or anything like that. It was quite simple. She would have been the worst patient ever. I mean, she wouldn't have liked to have been in a hospital bed or... You know, it, it would have been terrible. So, in a way, it was a blessing in disguise. I mean, it's sad, mm. really sad to lose her. But, I mean, it was just, you know, she would have been awful. You have had some, one, and still have some wonderful friendship. You still have a wonderful friendship with, with Joan Collins. How yes. did that start? Well, I was in New York in a, in a hotel, and they, we were waiting to go in and see a cabaret. Uh, artist, and uh, this man came over. It was uh, a man called uh, Robin Hulston. He said, oh, I, we've met briefly, and I said, oh, hi, uh, how are you? And I, he's, I said, who are you with? And he said, I'm with, uh, and he pointed over to Joan Collins, and I went, oh, my goodness, Joan Collins. Anyway, uh, he said, he introduced me, and then we went into the theater, and we happened to be sitting next to each other, and we gossiped all the way. The poor person doing the cabaret didn't stand a chance. We gossiped all the way through, and uh, then uh, I said goodbye. Then when I got back to London, her secretary rang and said, would you like to go to a do, a, a charity do with uh, Miss uh, Collins? So I said, I'd love to. And they said, that's lovely. It'll be £250. <laughs> 
So I thought, well, that's charming. So I thought, it's worth going out for £250 with Joan Collins. And from that moment on, we've become very good friends, and she is absolutely fantastic. I mean, we laugh a lot together. She plays Scrabble, which I love playing Scrabble. I'm going to spend uh, a week with her in Saint-Tropez in the summer, in August. And it, it's marvellous. But through Joan, I met some amazing people. I was staying with her in um, uh, Los Angeles, and the, well, there were a couple um, called Mr. And, uh, Barbara and Marvin Davis, and they were, he was a billionaire. And he was like the king, and they were like the king and queen of Hollywood. They knew everybody. And one day, uh, Barbara rang me at Jones and said, Christopher, we're having a 97th birthday for George Burns. Would you like to come? So I said, yes, I'd love to. So I put the phone down and screamed and went bananas around the flat. And the day came, we all went, and there was uh, the, the... In fact, funny enough, it was, I think it was twice as big as the area we're in now, was the foyer of their house. <laughs> and they had 12 tables of 10. And every table was star-studded. There was the Joan Collins table. There was the Sidney Poitier table. There was the Jackie Collins table. There was the Michael Caine table. There was all these stars. Everybody was there. And my table was myself, Shakira Caine, Frank Sinatra, our hostess, uh, George Burns, a woman, Sid Lawrence of Sid Lawrence and Edie Gourmet, and the daughter of the, uh, the couple whose house it was, and Dan Aykroyd. And Dan Aykroyd said to me, pinch yourself, Biggins. You don't often get nights like this. <laughs> well, I thought, wonderful, George Burns, sitting opposite George Burns. But I thought, if my mother could see me two seats away from Frank Sinatra, she'd go mad. So I called him Mr. Sinatra. I called him Sir. And eventually he said, Christopher call me Frank. So I thought, I can't at this moment go by. So I said, Frank, about eight years ago in London, I played Nathan Detroit in Guys and Dolls. And he said, do you know, Christopher, so did I. <laughs> and I thought, that's it. I can die now and go to heaven. I mean, it was marvelous. And then it, towards the end of dinner, he said, Christopher, will you come with me? And I thought, my God, he's going to kill me. <laughs> and we go into a corridor, and he wanted to have a cigarette, and his wife didn't like him smoking. So I chatted with him. And it was absolutely marvellous. What is great about uh, Joan is she's very free with her friends. You know, so you know how some people like to keep friends in compartments? Yeah, yeah. And she's not. She's, you know, it's a great group of people she likes to put together. And you, we've had so many... One, we went shopping in Los Angeles, just the two of us, and we bumped into Tina Turner. <laughs> and we had a conversation with her. So as we left, I said, how long have you known Tina? She said, never met her before in my life. <laughs> And that's what happens. In Hollywood is the most extraordinary place. You go to a restaurant, and suddenly, I was, remember we were in a, in a restaurant, and we were sitting there, and Spartacus came and joined us. Kirk Douglas. Kirk Douglas. Uh, Kirk, and this was quite a few years ago, but it was under... Spartacus yeah. <laughs> came and joined us. Unbelievable. Fantastic yeah, yeah. city. So, wonderful, wonderful pinch. I mean, there's got to be another version of this book, another... another Book. Yeah, I think Artemis. I might. I've done a... We extended the... I, I wrote a book when I came... When I did I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, and they wanted it very quickly, so we did it quickly. Then I did another four chapters, which sadly was mostly about people who I knew had died. Mm. I mean, I went through a period of losing about 40 to 50 friends five wow. years ago, and I put it down to having too many friends and getting old. Um, you know, these things happen. I'm sure we've all experienced mm -hmm. that. But it is terrifying how it happens so quickly. And I think I would now. There's a, a lot of stories I'd like to tell. Uh -huh. um, but, um, and, and the jungle was a wonderful experience. I mean, I, I wouldn't have missed it for the world. And I, I really mean that. And it, I, it was so fantastic to win and to find that the whole country was behind me, you know, and voting for me. And I had that awful Janice Dickinson. <laughs> Uh, who was the American model. Do you remember her? Oh, she was vile. What is she model? Uh, what is she model? What is she model? <laughs> Don't. She was just ghastly. And she thought it was just down to the two of us at the end. And she was convinced that she had won. And I was convinced she'd won. And when they called my name out, I couldn't believe it. She was furious. <laughs> she wasn't a happy what, bunny. What's amazing is that we, we tune in and we watch an hour of it. Or if it's on the other side, you see a few boring hours. You know, but you've got 24-7, you're in there. It must, 
it must change you. You, you must become very introspective. Well, you're, it, it's very true. And, and what happens is that you, you only see one hour of our 24 hours. There's nothing to read, nothing to watch, nothing to listen to. There's no taking us away and putting us in luxury hotels for the night. We, you sleep in open. I slept the best I've ever slept in my life. The first night, I thought to myself, what creepy crawlies am I going to have? Come across. But, you know, you, you get over that. And you, it's interesting because... Uh, there are 250 people in the making of it, and there are 120 cameras. No, there are 500 people and 125 cameras. And there's a camera on you everywhere. You can't, even, you can't do anything. I mean, the only place you could go and do something if you wanted to is in the Dunny. Well, the Dunny is the last place you want to go. It's vile. Absolutely fine. You just go in there for a quick wee wee or something, you know. Do they do that on purpose? Yeah, of course they do. Yeah. And you have to change that. Now, I, mean, I remember, do you remember when uh, Carol Thatcher did it and she wee weed outside yes, her yeah. bed? Yeah. Do you yeah. watch the series much? Yeah. You, so, which was. Do you love it? It's great, isn't it? It's really good. You did? Ah. So it, it's a wonderful series. I mean, what was the worst task that you had to do? Well, I think the sleeping with the 200 rats was not <gasps> great. And there's a wonderful sequence where um, uh, we, we, it became dark and they had a, a night camera in there. And we both fell asleep on these terribly tight uh, hammocks. And we both, uh, Anna Ryder Richardson and myself, both fell asleep. And I had a rat got on me and it was on my crutch. And I sort of woke up at a start, and I, I was feeling around, and you can oh, yeah. see me feeling around, and the rat <laughs> is there. And then all of a sudden, I cover it with this sheet. And when I sh I, sometimes when I do a talk, I show this, and the hysterical laughter. And then I realize it's something else, and then I go, oh my, and I go like that, and hit it off, and I go, oh my God, it's on me, it's on me. And uh, it was a very, very funny scene. And of course, the eating sequence, yeah. where I, I had to eat uh, a live witchetty grub, which was this long, and alive. And you're told by Dr. Bob, who is the most marvelous man on the series, brilliant. And he tells you to do things. He said, don't eat the head. So you have to bite, you put the body in wriggling around, then you bite off the head, and you have to get rid of everything that goes in. And the next thing was three live cockroaches. And as I bit into the first one, the other two were running around in my mouth. Ah! And then I had to eat a crocodile's hand. I had to eat an inch around the top. That was the first time I gagged, because it was so disgusting. And then I had the inevitable kangaroo's penis. And as I said at the time, I've had worse things in my mouth, <laughs> which got a big laugh and which ITV kept in, which was amazing. And then the kangaroo's ball. And then when I bit into that, all this liquid erupted in my mouth. I then had to chew the sack, and at the end, I say, well, nine, uh, nine months later, I gave birth to a joey. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was an amazing experience, and anybody that I know who's been in it always says the same thing. And it, 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 you go on to, because there's so much time of doing nothing, just thinking about things, you go on to another plane, which enables you to do all the things they ask you to do, unless you're Gillian McKeith who did nothing. I, if I was in there with Gillian McKeith, I know where I'd have killed her and I know where I'd have buried her. <laughs> I mean, she was... Because the other thing, which you've got to remember, you have to look to your fellow contestants because there's nothing to eat except what you manage to get, how many stars you get. And I remember one night, I, I, I did terribly well and I got something like... Uh, I think I got 10 stars. And so we had, you know, we we're going to have something fabulous. And they sent in a kangaroo's leg. Well, we were so appalled, we threw it back at them. <laughs> then we had to go and take it back because there was nothing else to eat. Oh. So this, you know, and it's amazing how you, 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 you know, you, you have to survive. It's, it's a really very good series. So we've covered uh, stage, we've covered television and film. Have we covered film? Uh, the Rocky Horror. Uh, Rocky uh, Horror, yeah, show. yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just a jump to the left yeah, and, and a, a step to the, the right. right. Put your hands on your hips. Bring your knees in tight. It's the pelvic thrust. <laughs> so I, uh, when they made the film of the stage show, which I'd been to the very first night at the theatre uh, ro uh, the, um, in Sloan Square. What's it called, the theatre in Sloan Square? 
theatre. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's the theatre in Sloane Square. And upstairs, it was uh, the first night of the, of the show. And it was so exciting. I mean, Tim Curry was unbelievable. The whole thing, you'd never seen anything like it in London. And so I knew a lot of the people. And when they came to make the film and they added 16 Transylvanians, I was uh, lucky enough to be, uh, get one of the parts. And the 16 of us, we got £100 a week. We were on the film for 10 weeks. At the end of it, I bought a sofa bed. And we were stoned every day because not that we were taking drugs, but the drugs were in the air. <laughs> So you couldn't help but get it, you know, it's sort of just breathing enabled you to get uh, a little high. And we'd had the best time. I mean, it was wonderful. Um, uh, another interesting thing is at the time when it was went out, the first night we all went to the premiere and it was a big, big flop. I mean, it was a disaster. And it was only when it went to America then the Americans decided to... Um, act along with it and do things like throw rice and water at the stage and do all the things and dress up that it became this cult movie and I think it's one of the biggest grossing mm, movies that it's ever been yeah. so if an, uh, an, I just say an American agent if an agent rang you up from Hollywood and said Mr. Biggins we've seen everything you've ever done from, <laughs> from that wonderful Heineken advert <laughs> right up to Porridge and Paul, um, and Paul Dark um, what is it you'd like to do? Because we're going to do anything you want to do. Well, you know, I, I don't like acting anymore because I find it difficult at my age to learn lines. Mm. Learning lines is very, very difficult. It's very interesting. There's a lot of people, and I'm, I'm not speaking out of turn when I say this, but a great actor, Michael Gambon, uh, he has an earpiece now. And when he did Churchill, do you know that, did you see that series he did on yeah. Churchill? He was fed all the lines. And a lot of people, who was the big, big, wonderful, in the 50s, film star, who they went on to be fat and huge and bloated? Orson Welles. Orson Welles. Orson Welles never, ever learnt a line. Really? He had all his lines on boards. And it was, you know, he just, he, he, he was a method actor and he didn't want, he just wanted everything to be spontaneous. Gosh. And, you know, there's a, a wonderful thing we have now in television called auto cue, mm. which I'm speaking to you now on... The moment it's over yeah, there, in the back it. of the... Yeah, yes, it's yeah. fabulous. Mm. No, I mean, auto cue is... A, and it's a great technique, isn't yes. it, to be... Yeah. To read to, uh, auto cue. Except I, when it rolls backwards. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. You've had that. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. But, you know, it, it is... It takes a lot to remember now. And I've, it's one of the things I've never been really great at. And I, I now would rather not do anything. But then I, I was saying yesterday that, you know, as you get older, um, don't you find that people who are getting older, <laughs> that you don't need so much, do you? You don't need, you know, we've got everything. We've got, we've got toasters and kettles. We don't need to go and buy another one of those. You know, we, and as long as we can go on holiday once or twice a year, I'm very happy. Different values. Different altogether. values. But, but, but we give you whatever you want to do. You, do you want to direct? Do you want a small part in a film? That oh, you're... I see what you say. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's oh, what I mean. I must tell you, I'm talking about um, lines there. I must tell you a funny story, and I'll come back to that, okay. that question if I may, is that my friend, uh, you, I think you know Miriam Margulies. Yeah. Do you know Miriam Margulies? Lovely J Jewish actress, fat. She was in the... Um, uh, in the um, Marigold, Hotel. Marigold Hotel. She yeah. is hysterical. And so she'd done a film with Barbara Streisand. Mm. And uh, it was uh, years ago, it was Yentl. Mm. So she, she knew Barbara. And then they asked her to do a film about four years ago, a scene in Los Angeles in a film. And it was with Barbara Streisand. So they said, uh, we'll pay first class rail travel, uh, rail travel, first Good. class Good. air travel. We'll put you in a first class hotel, four nights, $1,000. And she said, tell them I don't work for anything less than $25,000. And they came back within two minutes and said, that's fine. <laughs> So that shows what, how you've got to be. Yeah. So anyway, she goes out, and the scene is a dinner party scene. And uh, it, there's eight people around the table, and they're all around there. And uh, Barbara Streisand comes on, comes on, and she sits at the table, and she says hi to everybody. And all her lines are on autocue. They're everywhere. They're literally on every camera. Wow. So she does the scene as a master shot. Then they do all her close-ups. And then she left. 
And everybody else had to stay there, and someone stood in for Barbara Streisand to do all their close-ups, all the other close-ups. And at the end of this, when she, before she left, uh, an actress said, oh, Barbara, could we have a, a photograph before you leave? And she said, no, <laughs> and just left. You see, that's, uh, that is, I think, so strange, don't you? So it, it's where you believe your own yeah, publicity, yeah. I think. So, yeah. But, you know, she obviously finds... I mean, I, I remember I've, I've, I've seen her in Cabaret and I've seen in London and I've seen Frank Sinatra. And both of them had auto cue all the way round. In fact, Frank Sinatra sang my way and he got all the words wrong, <gasps> even though it was there written. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I could have done it better than yeah, him. Yeah, yes. Still, it's, it's terrible things when you get older. This yeah. is the awful thing. OK, so back to the question. Oh, yeah, what was that? So you can <laughs> reel them in. The part, the, the part you can play, we'll, we'll, we'll put an auto cue for you, yeah. but is there a role, is there something you would like no, to... No, there isn't a role. I don't think I really want to. I mean, I'm very happy to do the odd uh, cameo part, which is, you know, I, I'm very happy to do, and, and, you know, and I'm sure there's a way round of, of, of doing it, and if they do it in sections, I could learn it little bits and pieces. But I, the only thing I would like to do, and I've done a lot of it in theatre, but I would love to direct a film. And I, I would, because I like being bossy. I like being, um, hello, it's all right. You Don't were we... standing at the back, weren't you? Yeah. You was, yes, that's we right. We haven't nobody's noticed. No. Don't worry. No. We hardly notice you creep in no, then. No. That was marvellous. <laughs> <laughs> no, and uh, so that's what, that's what I'd like to do, is, is, is direct a film. Any particular film? No, I don't think so. Anything that... Uh, that took my fancy, you know. I'm, I, I, I just love directing. Any direct directors you'd like to? Any any actors you'd love to work with? Yes, I mean there are lots of actors. I I mean I'm 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 a great I'm a great television fiend. I love television. I love Sky has so many wonderful programs now. If you get Sky, do you get Sky down here? Have you yes. got Have you got colour yet, Kadali? <laughs> yeah, we got electricity. We? We've got a bit of electricity. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I, I, I love it. In fact, I've got 54 inches in the bedroom. Have it's you? amazing. <laughs> and it comes up automatically on a, on a, on a thing. You know, it's lovely. I yeah, love television. Yeah, yeah. Nothing nice. I mean, I, we always record things, but I love uh, days, on a, perhaps on a Sunday, where you just sit in, or lie in bed and have eat and drink and read the papers and put the television on. Well, it's of course, marvelous. you've got Pole Dark now. Pole, yes. Really like pole. Are you enjoying the new Pole Dark series? Yes, I think it's good. I like it. So what have you got lined up next? Well, I'm doing a lot of corporate events, which I really enjoy. Um, and I'm doing a big series for ITV in uh, uh, October, September, October, which I think will either be shown at the end of the year or beginning of next year. I can't tell you, sadly, what it's about. But it's a big series, and um, uh, it's, I think it's going to be really good fun. It's a very interesting subject and we're going to go out. It's, it's like a documentary, ah. uh, but I think it's going to be a fun documentary. I think it'll be very controversial, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, it, it's, it's really good. And I'm doing, as I said, pantomime again. So things are really good, you know, and as long as I can get time to go off to the south of France with Joan Collins, you know, yeah, I'll yeah. go. Do you want to come? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you had your time over again, is there anything you, you would have changed and thought, I wish I'd done a bit more of this, a bit more of that? Or? Nothing. Nothing. How I have had hear. the most perfect career. I've, had the most, I've got the most wonderful friends. I've met wonderful people. I have really enjoyed my life. That's why I do so much charity work, because it's a pleasure to put back into an industry that's been so wonder, wonderful to me. I mean, you know, I know a lot of actors... Uh, who are brilliant, and they never get the opportunity. When people come to me for advice about being an actor, I always say to them, look, it's a terrible job. Don't do it. Don't even think about it. But if you really want to do it, you have to know that it's very, very difficult. It's all about being in the right place at the right time and knowing the right people. I mean, it's as simple as that. And if you know people who want to be actors, give them my number and I'll tell them. Because it's a horrible job if you're not successful. If you are, there's nothing better. And if you can meet people like I've met, you have the best time. And it is a wonderful, wonderful job. Well, it's been lovely to hear about it as well, hasn't it? Ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Biggins. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.
Before we go, I don't, I don't know how much time. Does anybody want to ask a quick question yes. or anything? Anybody want to know? Question. Anything personal? You can ask me anything you like. Yes, sir. Well, I do, I do, my, my big one's the Variety Club, I do a charity um, for uh, di diabetes, which I suffer, type 2 diabetes, I do um, uh, all the cancer ones, especially bowel cancer, because my father died of bowel cancer, I do, uh, I do about 10 major charities, and then I do things for friends, and of course the trouble is I have too many friends. Mm. But it is wonderful. I mean, you know, all you have to do, all I have to do is spend an evening like this, and I perhaps at the end of the dinner will stand up and auction some items, and, and that's it. It's very easy, and it raises a lot of money. And I've raised, I, did, I think we worked it out that I've probably raised about 20 to 30 million over the years. And it, it's just marvellous to be able to, because as we all know, Charities are, are, are suffering. You know, there's a lot of... A lot of uh, why did you ask that? Did you want me to do something for you? <laughs> Anybody else? Anything else? Yes? Can you fancy a ring of this jockey ship? I heard you want to Well, that's, uh, I would love to do. I, I took over from Paul O'Grady for two weeks on Radio 2 the uh, yeah. six o'clock, and I loved it, I have to say. It's marvellous, and uh, it, that's why you did so much radio, because mm. you don't have to put any makeup on or anything, you know. <laughs> she used to go in looking like always, an absolute... Always looking back. No. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's different. See, did you do it live, or did you record? No, live. You did it live. Oh, when, when live get, radio yeah, is course. fantastic. And yeah. we did live television. The first six series, six episodes of Surprise, Surprise was live. <gasps> And I remember we had a, a, a wonderful time. Scylla was there, I was here, and we had this man. No, we ha I, I had this woman, and this man Scylla had on us, and he wanted to propose to this uh, girl on television. So he had the ring, and he came over, and he knelt in front of me and this girl, and he opened the, the, the box, and there was this ring, and this is live television, and he said, Deirdre, will you marry me? And she went, no. <laughs> And, and Scylla said, oh, go on. I mean, it was hysterical, I can't tell you. Live, doing things live are the yeah, best things, yeah, aren't they? I mean, you've done yeah. so much live yeah, on television yeah, yeah. and radio. And it is just wonderful. And, and I, but I, I really enjoy doing the Paul O'Grady show. And I've done also Lisa Tarbuck's show I've taken mm. over from. It's a commitment, though. You have to do it every week. And I think you're right. If, you, if it's supposed to be a live show... I mean, sometimes, you know, you get a lot of people who do it for a long time and they don't do it live. No. They go in and record. And they I... get pre-recorded sections, yes, interviews. that's right. And it doesn't sound the same, does no, it? No, it doesn't. No, no but I, I love, and I'd love to do a radio show. Yeah. It would be really yeah. great. Anybody else want to ask anything? Yes. yes. Thank you. It's really, really interesting. It's, it's really wonderful to hear your stories. Thank you. that you haven't met yet that you'd like to meet? David Beckham. <laughs> oh, really? I think he's gorgeous. <laughs> I know, I really, and funny enough, he was down in Glastonbury, did you see on the news? Uh, which was so char... It was lovely, wasn't it? it was char and I think he's a really good role model. And uh, it's a shame he's married to that horrible woman. That, oh. That's the only thing. Well, she never smiles. I'm sure that... I, I met them... I, I tell a lie, I have met him. Uh, we were in the Ivy. There's a restaurant in London called the Ivy. Oh, we'd get him one down here. We'd get him one in Exeter. Did Are you? you? Know that? Yeah. The Ivy. Yeah. Oh, there you go. You must go. It's lovely. Anyway, we were sitting there, and he was sitting with his wife in a, uh, across the room, and he kept smiling at me, and I kept smiling at him, and I thought, mm, my luck's in. Like... <laughs> anyway, I went to the loo, and I came back by him, and she got, as I spoke to him, she got out her makeup and put, you know, started to, you know, put lippy on and pad herself like that. And uh, David Beckham said, oh, he said, I was brought up with you. He said, I loved Red to Ghost. I loved On Safari. <laughs> we were chatting. And it was really, really nice. She didn't say one word. Mm. So anyway, I went to I was thrilled because he'd said that. There's a marvellous story about the Queen. A friend of mine is called Derek Dean, uh, who is a very famous, uh, was a very famous ballet star with the, with the opera house, uh, the Royal Ballet. And uh, he was a great friend of Princess Margaret. A great friend. Oh, right. Okay. Anyway, he went to Windsor... 
he went to Windsor Castle for dinner, and it was just the, the Queen and Princess Margaret, and I think, uh, I think perhaps it was somebody else. Anyway, so he went, and it was black tie, and he, he'd had a, been dancing, and he had to wear... Um, um, what are they, the pincers, what are they called? Uh, sneakers. What are they trainers. Called? Trainers. And he had to wear trainers with his black tie. And so uh, he went into this room at Windsor Castle and, they, and uh, he sat down and the Queen and Princess Margaret was there. And then the Queen came in and he stood up and then she gave him a funny look about his wearing his trainers. And he said, I've been dancing and my feet are all, you know, swelled up and everything. So uh, she said, um, oh, and they, they were talking. And as he was talking to the Queen, the Queen went into her handbag, she got a powder puff, and she went... <laughs> <laughs> so, what were you... And there was the Queen of England with four rings of powder, and she didn't blend it in, she didn't do anything. And he had to have this conversation with her. She is camp, the queen. I can't I tell love you. Her, love She's her. absolutely divine. Absolutely. She has. I've been. Well, I know other times, but she does have a wonderful, wonderful sense of humour, and she loves a dry martini. <laughs> Don't we all? Yeah. <laughs> Time for one. Time for one. Um, I think that That's must, it. That well, must thank be. Thank you it. so much. It's yeah. been really, really. Thank you. Yeah. And Great I, audience. I, uh, And I'd very much like to thank my friend Judy, because Judy, poor girl, she tore those up quite rightly, because we, she Never. doesn't quite Never. know what we're going to do. Never. And it's, digressing is a marvellous thing, I think. You know, one subject leads on to another subject, and you look at something, you know, it just, and it, you make it so easy. Thank you. Thank it's you. been a real treat. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. You're listening to TCR Radio.